So before we talk about diff and diff specifically, we need to talk about this broader field of um, causal inference called quasi-experiments and what makes them different from real experiments or actual experiments. Um, so as you remember from the last session, we talked all about randomized controlled trials or RCTs. And the main conclusion we came to was that RCTs are great. Um, it would be awesome if we could run an RCT for every policy or every program that we're interested in to see if there's a causal effect. Um, the reason we love them is because you get to cut all of the arrows going into your DAG node for the program, um, which means all the confounding is gone. And all you're left with is the direct causal effect of your program or the policy on the outcome. Um, and so we love these things. However, it is impractical and often unethical and illegal to do them all the time for every single policy um, or any program you might think of. Um, you might be limited by budgets. You might be limited by ethical constraints. You might be limited by law. You can't randomly assign people to smoke for 40 years, for instance. That's illegal um, and unethical. And it would take 40 years to get the results anyway. So we don't want to do that. So... Um, what the causal inference world does instead of relying on randomized control trials or random experiments is they turn often to something called a quasi-experiment, which is something that is like an experiment but not quite. The official definition here um, is basically something where instead of randomly assigning people to do stuff, you let other people randomly assign people to do stuff or let the government do it or let nature do it or let something do it for you. Um, there are all sorts of situations like this. Um, as you keep looking at different examples in your readings, you'll see people do all sorts of things like hurricane evacuations, um, treating like the, the presence of a hurricane as an experiment. And you can see what happens if people evacuate to one state versus another state. You can't legally do that as a researcher, but you can kind of jump on board after and see what happens as, as refugees go to different places. Um, or in the case of the uh, Oregon um, Medicaid expansion experiment, the researchers didn't do the actual assignment. The government did through whatever system they're doing. Um, but then the researchers jumped on board, and they're using that as a quasi-experiment to study the effect of gaining more access to health care um, on all sorts of different outcomes. So these are examples of quasi-experiments. Um, the main definition that you should remember basically this, um, that a quasi-experiment is somewhere where you do not assign people to treatment or control. Um, in a randomized control trial, you get to do that. That's why we talked about how to randomize. Um, you roll dice, you flip coins, you use random.org, you do whatever you want to be able to assign, but you're in charge of assignment. With quasi-experiments, you don't get to assign, um, which means there might be some self-selection. Um, but it also means that it has actually happened. It's a real life experience or experiment or a real life occurrence. Um, and so if we're talking about validity, external validity for quasi experiments is generally pretty great because they are things that have happened in the world. Um, it's not people in a laboratory setting. It's you're not asking people hypothetically how they would respond if something happened to them. You're watching them respond as something's happening to them. So you can probably generalize from the results of your study fairly well. Um, the issue with selection, though, is that people often self-select into these things. And so if you treat um, hurricane evacuation, for instance, as, an, as a quasi-experiment, um, you would have to assume that people who are evacuating from a hurricane zone are going to randomly choose which state they're going to go to, but they're probably going to go to a place where they have um, family connections or friend connections or something, um, and there are systematic reasons for why they're choosing that, and so there's still self-selection built into, into the process of um, dividing people into treatment and control. Um, so that the assumption underneath all of these quasi-experiments is that you have to pretend that assignment to treatment is as if random. Um, so you basically say people chose their different outcomes because of this quasi-experiment as if it was randomly assigned. There's no selection bias happening. Um, it's just that some other researcher or nature or somebody um, assigned people to treatment and control. You didn't. And so that's kind of a big assumption to make. Um, and in all of these quasi-experimental designs that you'll see, um, a significant portion of every um, research report has paragraphs and paragraphs explaining um, if that's true, 
and how they overcame it if it's not true um, or what they did to test to see if it's true. Um, and so this is a very big assumption that, that you have to make um, for any quasi-experimental situation. Um, where this gets kind of confusing, um, especially because we've spent so much time on DAGs and causal graphs, is um, you will often not see DAGs in social science research, um, in, in think tank reports or other things. It's not just because they don't want to um, make communicating to the public more tricky because not everybody understands DAGs, um, but in part it's because many econometricians and political scientists and sociologists don't use DAGs in their research designs. Um, because um, in part they're kind of a new thing, and in part because there's kind of this bias towards natural experiments or quasi-experiments as more credible. Um, so we've done lots of work with DAGs. Um, the last session we talked all about matching and inverse probability weighting. For your problem set, you did matching and inverse probabil probability weighting. You'll get more practice with that throughout the semester. Um, the cool thing about that is you don't have to think of a specific research design situation um, where, like with diff and diff, as we'll see, you have to have a kind of treatment group, a kind of control group, and a before and an after. And as long as you have those four situations, you can figure out the diff and diff. Um, and it's a very situational based thing. With DAGs, um, you don't really need a specific situation. You can just say um, people signed up for a program. Um, some people didn't sign up for a program. Let's see if there's an effect. And as long as you can close all the back doors and make a plausible story that the arrow between um, your program and your outcome is isolated or identified, then you can talk about causality. And so DAGs can work for any type of observational data, um, any situation where you're thinking about trying to measure the effect of something on something else, you can draw a DAG for it. It doesn't have to be a quasi-experiment necessarily. Um, quasi-experiments are a little bit different. Um, and the reason why you'll see them without DAGs is because technically you can do them without drawing a DAG. The whole point of drawing DAGs and doing matching and inverse probability weighting is to identify one pathway between X and Y. Our whole goal was to isolate that pathway. Um, with quasi-experiments, your whole goal is also to isolate specific pathways. That's why you do these things. It's just that with quasi-experiments, instead of closing back doors and thinking about confounding and things like that, your whole identification strategy doesn't come from stopping confounding, it comes from the context of the quasi-experiment. So for instance, a diff and diff, as we'll see in a minute, requires a treatment group, a control group, and a before and an after. And if you have those four things, then you can talk about identification of that arrow between treatment and output or outcome. Um, with regression discontinuity, we'll talk about that in a couple sessions. That has to do with a specific kind of story where some people are close to a threshold um, for like a cutoff point for qualifying for Medicaid or qualifying for SNAP or qualifying for something. And you compare the people right on either side of that cut point and consider them treatment and control. Um, that only works if you have a specific cut point. Um, and so because you're relying on kind of the context of that situation, you can talk about identifying that pathway between X and Y or treatment and outcome. And so that is where the focus is for all of these quasi experiments. And when you see them um, in the wild, you'll see pages and pages of like huge sections of the paper saying, here's our identification strategy. And often that's the actual heading for that section is identification strategy. Um, and that whole section is focused on isolating the pathway between X and Y. And in the absence of DAGs, that's uh, it takes a lot of work to do um, because you have to convince the reader that there's no other influence coming from other, um, other confounding factors. But you don't use the language of confounding. You just say other things that might mess up the relationship. And so you rely heavily on the fact that it's an experiment and you have kind of a treatment group and kind of a control group. And that's enough to make it kind of like an RCT. Um, and so that's where the identification comes from. Um, with DAGs, the identification strategy there um, with like match or with the other things we've seen is to use matching and inverse probability weighting and other ways to statistically adjust for the confounding. And your identification then comes from closing all of the back doors and making sure that arrows by itself. But you don't necessarily need a treatment group and a control group. Um, so 
Um, again, quasi-experiments are everywhere, um, in part because nowadays they're seen as more credible than just throwing a whole bunch of stuff into an inverse probability weighting model. Um, that's changing as DAGs are becoming more uh, popular nowadays, and people are learning about them in grad school and getting PhDs in them with social science focuses, um, which is good, um, because you can kind of move away from relying solely on um, natural experiments and quasi-experiments to do causal inference. The other cool thing about DAGs, like don't forget about them because they're still important, you can actually draw a DAG for any quasi-experiment. Um, there's a specific DAG structure that comes from diff and diff, and we'll see that in a little bit. Um, there's a specific DAG structure that comes from regression discontinuity and from instrumental variables and the other quasi-experiments that exist. Um, you can still do your backdoor closing and con like fixing confounders and all of that stuff with these natural experiments and with these quasi-experiments. Um, it actually enhances um, your analysis if you know DAGs. Um, so don't forget that stuff. Like That's still important. Um, but just know that you'll often see diff and diff or these other types of natural experiments or quasi-experiments um, that don't have DAGs with them at all. Um, you're still identifying a causal effect, but as it says right here, the context of the design, um, so the situation that you find yourself in, that is what gives you the power of identification. And so often you get economists and political scientists that spend all day just kind of figuratively looking out the window, waiting for some sort of diff and diff situation to appear, or waiting for some discontinuity to appear, or waiting for some instrumental variable to appear, some sort of natural or quasi experiment to appear, and then they jump on that to measure some sort of causal effect. Um, and so again, you kind of have to wait for those specific contexts to appear. With matching and inverse probability weighting, you don't necessarily need to wait for some experimental type situation to magically appear in nature. Um, so, with quasi-experiments, there are generally three types of quasi-experiments, um, three general categories that you'll see, um, and this is what we're going to be talking about for the next three um, topics in this, in this section of the course. Um, you'll also see these all over the place in economics papers and policy papers and political science papers. Um, you can generally categorize a paper as one of these three things. Um, you have difference in differences, which is what we're talking about this week. Um, or these next two sessions. Um, you'll often see it abbreviated as DID or DD or diff and diff. They all mean the same thing. It's this difference in differences analysis or this difference in differences situation, this context that lets you identify a causal relationship. You also have something called regression discontinuity, um, which you'll see abbreviated as RD or RDD. That second D stands for design, so regression discontinuity design. Um, this is another specific context where you can identify the relationship between X and Y. Um, this relies on some sort of um, arbitrary cutoff, and then you compare people on either side of the cutoff um, and treat them as treatment and control. And that's the way you do regression discontinuity. Finally, um, you have instrumental variables, which is kind of the weirdest way of, of working with quasi-experiments. Um, we'll spend a couple sessions on this in a few weeks. Um, they're weird. Um, the way they work is you basically have something totally unrelated to your outcome that explains the variation in your treatment. Um, and then you use that to be able to isolate the relationship between your treatment and your outcome. Um, it, we'll see once we get further on in the semester, we'll be able to draw a DAG for that and it'll make a lot more sense. Um, so don't worry if it, it's confusing, we will get to that. Um, just know that these are kind of the three main families of quasi-experimental designs and approaches that we'll be talking about this semester. Um, and you sh you'll know how to analyze all of these things, and it should be fun and exciting. <laughs>